Stick to the Miss World format were interludes, during which the viewers at home could either sit watching open mouth with astonishment, or else discuss whether Miss Venezuela could still win after falling downstairs and flattening Miss Puerto Rico. <laughs> These interludes were the hugely expensive production numbers. Tonight, tonight. If the United Nations had looked like the Miss World contest, we would have watched it all day. And if the United Nations had sounded like Miss World, all the interpreters on Earth would have had a job. They hadn't been interpreting like it since the Americans and the North Koreans took six months to negotiate their first coffee break at Pyongyang. Stacey, can you ask uh, Nini, first of all, if they have many earthquakes in her part of the world? Se tiene muchos terremotos in Colombia. Bueno, no precisamente terremotos, pero Colombia se presta mucho a movimientos sísmicos, puesto que el relieve es un poco eh, variable. Not many. <laughs> and once a year, at the end of the show, up there on your television screen and available nowhere else, there was a miracle. Scores of beautiful women of different nationalities, all crying with happiness because they had lost while the woman who won cried with even greater happiness because she had such friends whose good wishes would support her in a mission of peace and love. At Miss World 1975 is Miss Puerto Rico. Incredible sensation here at the Albert Hall. Romelia Vesset, 18 years old, absolute pandemonium breaking out there. She's overcome with emotion. Miss Sweet, Miss World. Miss Argentina is Miss World, 1978. And with us tonight are two Miss World winners and one who lost. Melanie Abdoun, you were Miss UK, but you were pipped at the post for Miss World. How did you manage that, that smile of happiness when you lost? Um, I think, Clive, it's not really the moment to be um, causing a tantrum on stage about the fact that you haven't actually won. You spend a hard time working a month with a lot of other girls and by then you've made a lot of friends and stuff but you know that you, once you get to the, the final part of the show you, if you know you're not in the top ten or the top five you sort of come to terms with that at that point. Leslie Langley, did uh, winning Miss World change your life forever? No, it changed it in a small way as much as I met my husband to be and I got involved in the music business which for me was a much more real down-to-earth world that I enjoyed. Do you have any regrets about having done it? Not at all, no. Rita Ferrier, I hope, I know the other girls won't mind me saying this, but you're the one that's stuck in my mind more than anybody because you had these most amazing academic qualifications. What was a girl like you doing in a beauty contest? Well, India was sending their first contestant that year in 1966 to the Miss World competition. And I was a finally a medical student at the time and decided to enter it as a joke in college. And it was a joke that in two months I'd won the Miss Bombay, Miss India and Miss World. So it was a, a joke that went a little bit too far for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I must say it was a very positive experience and I was happy to return to my medical studies after I completed my year as Miss World. So it didn't really change too many things for me. Could I ask all three of you, knowing what you know now, in the same circumstances, would you do it again? 
Well, as far as I'm concerned, there are some things you only do once in life, oh, yes. and that's it. That is one of them, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, Miss Worlds and almost Miss World, thank you very much. An intelligent man mixed up in the beauty pageant business must have been in two minds at the very least. Yet the most intelligent man of them all either went on volunteering for the job or else he had a brave way of smiling when they sent him on at gunpoint. Now, if any of these girls appear to you at home to have short, fat, hairy legs, then I suggest you get your set adjusted because, believe me, they're all very beautiful indeed. Would you come a little closer? It's quite safe. Um, where do you live in Italy? Dove abita in Italia? A Treviso. A Treviso. This is North Italy. It is, I can tell you, yeah. <laughs> what about the world inflation problem? Are you interested in that? Well, no. Good evening, and welcome to this, the 24th Miss World contest, which means that the original Miss World must be a poor old thing in her, in her mid-40s by now. wonder where she is. <laughs> Was he ruthlessly exploiting women? Was he secretly setting the whole thing up rotten? Let's ask him. From England, a suave 43, 32, 41, it's Michael Aspel. <laughs> Michael, did you enjoy just then looking back at those heady days and all those glamorous outfits? I look back on it, as everyone else you've talked to tonight, with a, with a strange <laughs> mixture of affection and fear and regret and uh, other things. It wasn't always as glamorous as Miss World, was it? How about the local contests? The most dangerous thing in the world, if you're involved in the beauty business in any way, the most dangerous thing is to be a judge, particularly ah. on, a, on a small level at a village fete, because I've been through that many times, and mothers are more vicious there than any mother <laughs> beside the beautiful baby contest. I went to a village fete once, and um, I declared it open, and then the vicar's wife and the headmaster and I judged this competition. Six girls, quite pretty, 15 shillings top prize. We gave this girl the prize, and I was attacked by the mother of one of the girls. She hit me with her umbrella, said, you've got no bloody taste in women. <laughs> As a presenter of this world, you were, you were thought of at the time as the luckiest man in the country. Did you look forward to the presenting the shows from that aspect, as it were? No, everyone thought it was a riot of lust, and one just had the, you know, the pick of all these girls. It was the most decorous business, and they were very strictly chaperoned from, the, from start to finish. But there was one remarkable girl, I think, uh, I, I won't say which country she's from, it was Sierra Leone, and she was... Uh, <laughs> She was an extraordinary girl, and she came late to the competition. I had to see her and, and ask the details of her background and interests, etc. And she was extraordinary. She just looked at me and she said, you've got a nice voice. And I said, oh, thank you. And she said, how old are you? And I said, 34, a long time ago. And uh, she said, but you are still a lion who roars. <laughs> it doesn't really seem to look at like a show where physical danger was involved. There was no physical danger for the girls because they were very well looked after, but there, there was physical danger for people involved in the hustle and the rush afterwards. And there was one wonderful occasion where the set had been designed with gauze, thin gauze lining five foot drops all over the set. And when they said, Miss World 19 whatever, the photographers were unleashed and they rushed across the set and this gauze just gave way and about 20 of them fell into this five foot gap. <laughs> One of them broke his leg. It was a wonderful evening. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get involved in the, in the aspirations of the women? Uh, like Rita, I just, we were just talking to earlier. No, I didn't uh, get involved in that. I mean, Rita is uh, unique, of course, but then not, uh, there were a lot of girls, very clever girls, who went back to their studies afterwards and have gone on to have much more fulfilling lives than perhaps me. And uh, <laughs> so we didn't have time. And as you've heard, half of them weren't true anyway. The yeah. things you were given. That was a revelation, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> just, just made up on the Say spot. that you're a sword fighter and carry a sabre around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't uh, the whole business do any harm, do you think? No. It was utterly, utterly harmless. And it was, it was sweet and it was innocent. And uh, there was a lot of uh, vicarious thrill from watching that, I suppose, yeah. at home. But as we've heard before, women enjoyed the show as well. Yeah. And so it was, an, it was an event, it was part of our calendar, almost like the Grand National. When that was on, you didn't miss it. And people had a kind of respect for television then, and, uh, and television took itself rather more seriously than it does now. And so it was an event not to be missed. It was the kind of television I remember, and I know I'm going to remember it to the grave, and I, you played a key part in it. It's been an honour to have you here. Thank you very much, Michael Aspall. <laughs> Thank you.
After 10 years in the satellite wilderness, Miss World is coming back. We're assured that the show will be revamped, decamped, and never again will we be able to switch on the TV and see a platoon of lovelies lined up in their swimsuits. We can switch on the TV and see them lined up wearing nothing at all, but that's drama after 9 o'clock. <laughs> Yet what we loved about the beauty pageants, and women love them at least as much as men, was the nonsense. Make sense of it and you kill it. What we loved was this. She's all you'd ever want. She's the kind I'd like to come on and take to dinner.